Uh, next up is a panel discussion. The topic is Media, Me and the Mirror. Have we got as good as we have given? This panel is going to be moderated by Mr. Rahul Bose. And the panelists, one of them, uh, Mr. Yogi Sadhwani, unfortunately is late. So if he manages to uh, reach before we finish the panel discussion, he'll join us. Uh, I'll just quickly introduce the other panel members to you. Ms. Anayata Mukherjee, uh, she is currently an assistant editor at the Times of India. She has worked in both the Mumbai and Delhi offices of the newspaper. After pursuing a master's degree in developmental studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, London, Anayata has written on a wide range of subjects including education, child rights, environment, right to information and human rights. She is one of the more respected journalists for ethical investigation, reporting and follow-up on sexuality and sexual violence cases. She is known to have highlighted problems in the POXO Act and the problems involved in criminalizing consent. Anayata has won the Sanskriti Award for Journalism in 2010. Our next panelist is Ms. Swati Chakravarti. She was just up on stage and I just introduced her to you. Um, the third panelist is Dhanya Rajendran. She's the managing editor of the News Minute, a web platform that focuses on news from the southern states. She has also worked as South India head for the English news channel Times Now, reporting extensively from the states of Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Kerala and Andhra Pradesh. Many of her reports on human rights violations and corruption resulted in national investigations, including the two by the country's apex agency, the CBI. She has consistently reported on issues related to child sexual abuse and is very passionate about the subject. I welcome all our panelists and Rahul up on stage. Is it just me or is it really cold out here? Anyone feeling cold? Okay, how many people want the AC to be lowered or slowered? Super. Uh, Suchi, can we just get this done? In this country, you either die of the heat or you freeze. There's just no middle ground. Just like nuances lost in this country. One day you're a hero and one day you're hanged. <laughs> so, once I have lamented the absence of nuance, let me... Um, when um, Suchi, Janvi and I were discussing this topic... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think the, the thing that really resonated with all of us was that invariably when you have, and I have taken part in many panels on film and media and social activism and media and this and media and that and media, and invariably what happens is that there is a kind of aggressive a lens put on the media. Why don't you? How did you? And then we thought you would kind of thing. So I said, hang on a second, hang on a second. What is the root uh, issue that you'd like to talk about? And basically the root issue is that not enough is known about what's being discussed in this room. The fact that it's endemic, the fact that the 50% uh, of 400 million becomes an, an epidemic, uh, the fact that it, most of it happens at home or with acquaintances. This is stuff that is like a deaf spot in India, in most societies. I remember in Belgium when the, the massive um, a case of child sexual abuse was unearthed about maybe 15 or 20 years ago, there was absolute shock in that society because it had been shrouded in silence like it is anywhere else in the world. He said, before, when we get into this topic and we talk today, let's first ask ourselves, have we done enough? So what I would very much like, and I think my questions will invariably be uh, mirrored, is have we done enough before we can ask you, what have you done? So there's no us and, uh, there's, a, there's a we and you, however, uh, the reason why we framed it like this was that we believe that uh, if it has to be two sides of the coin, then somebody has to make that coin, otherwise it's not going to happen. So I really think that we should kick that, kick this uh, uh, discussion and, and, and I'll just, uh, I'll ask questions but please feel free to jump in whenever you want to in the most rude manner possible, it makes no difference at all because um, we're Indian. So, uh, sorry? And I work with <laughs> And you work with uh, No, you'll be listened to out here. Everybody will listen to you. And you'll have lots of time to speak. And nobody will interrupt you. So, um, let me first start, uh, um, uh, Swati, since uh, we just saw that um, clearly it was the tip of the iceberg as far as 
you were concerned. Anybody who is remotely sensitive and listening to you would understand uh, how deeply uh, this whole process has moved you. Uh, one crore, 40? Yeah, something. Yes. But it's a mad yeah. number. I mean, I'm not very good with numbers. It must have just it's been a deluge. It was. Um, so let me start with you. Um, my first question was going to be to Swati, how did she fathom how large the problem of CSA in our country was? But clearly, we have half the answer. But if you could um, now, now that we're asking, elaborate a little bit more on, that's the deluge of responses, but post that as you began to meet people or even while you were preparing for the episode, when did it start to strike you that this was uh, far deeper and far more endemic than you imagined? Well, Rahul, when we um, started discussing internally about topics, uh, this topic came up. And uh, <clears throat> initially, so there was heated debate within our team, which was about four of us, very small core team, where uh, there were some uh, who said that, why are we, you know, talking about this, eh? So, you know, talking about sex on, uh, in any form or fashion on mainstream television, that too on a general entertainment channel uh, at an 11 a.m. in the morning Sunday timing. It's not going to be acceptable. And uh, in fact, we needed to make some cuts for censor. We actually had to. When there was talk of penetrative sex or oral sex, we had to remove some of the stuff from the episode. But uh, there were, so there were two people who said that this doesn't seem to be such a big issue, is it? Because we had criteria to select topics. One is that it should be an issue of national consequence, something that affects all of India, not just a pocket. Secondly, it should be an issue in which any individual, whether empowered, disempowered, anything, should be able to look at themselves and say, you know what, this is an issue on which I can do at least something to make a change. Okay, so does this really fit into this whole national thing? And then, uh, and there were a couple of us in the room who were arguing very much in favor of doing this episode. Uh, it was only later, I must confess, that uh, uh, then we said, okay, let's look at statistics, let's dig out. So there was this fantastic um, women and child development uh, ministry survey that threw up the statistics as being, uh, you know, something like 50%. So one one out of two and uh, that was that kind of did it for us later on when w i went a little as we progressed and i and i realized uh, things a little more deeply i realized that the motivations of the people who were in that core team of ours of four two who were arguing in favor of doing this episode were actually survivors themselves and uh, the reason why they were arguing in favor of it is because they perhaps had more than an inkling of how deep and how dark the situation is. Danya, I'm going to come to you. Um, we were just discussing before um, this panel. I was chatting with Anahita and Swati and I was saying that um, there's a difference between a shroud over an issue and being sensitive to reportage uh, reportage of an issue where you don't take names and you know you don't sensationalize the incident. How do you strike that balance? So I can narrate something from my personal experience. I used to work with Times Now for eight years and we have covered a lot of child sexual abuse cases and each time something happens, for example most of the cases which we would look, up, look upon as traveling sex offenders or cases which includes um, schools in the schools in Chennai or Bangalore in the cities, right? So a specific case happened where a woman complained to the police about her husband having sexually assaulted or raped her child. And he was a, he was a diplomat with a French embassy. So the first thing is to get as many details as possible. We are all on the breaking news mode and everyone's rushing to get the victim, the perpetrator. For two, three days this goes on and every newspaper is competing with the other to get the exclusive of that story. Every channel is trying to get the exclusive. Finally, that mother told me on the third or fourth day, and I think that was a turning point for me. She told me that, look, all of you got your exclusives. Everyone's got every single detail, whether my child's vagina was, uh, uh, you know, torn apart, uh, how, how she was abused. Google will never let her forget. You guys got all your exclusives. You have moved on in life to your next story. Even our case will maybe finish in the next 10 years or 15 years. But how is my daughter going to forget that? And perhaps that was a changing point for me as a reporter because then I realized that 
reportage in India, and I don't think you can blame anyone for it, but it's mostly from the viewpoint of how to get the perpetrator, how to get the accused behind bars, how to make the police file a charge within 90 days. No one thinks on behalf of the victim. And that's where I think sensationalization creeps in, and it's still happening. We are only reporting uh, from the perspective of how to get an accused in, how to get those statistics up. There is absolutely no sensitivity, I think, um, except maybe, I am sure she would agree with me, except maybe a small percentage of reporters or editors who think about how to actually not report too many details. Anaita, do you want to um, expand on that? Yeah, I would agree with her and I think um, I see a growing sensitivity over time. I don't know how many of you here would agree with me, but I do feel that there is a sort of censure with the media putting a, you know, you don't put all the details, you sort of learn over time that there are things you don't have to put out. Um, you don't sensationalize a rape case. Um, I actually think the media has begun curbing itself better than it did earlier. Okay, I, I would totally disagree. <laughs> I mean, the feeding frenzy, Anna Hazare, and I just tweeted, in fact, about the latest, um, the latest, sorry? Yeah, I mean, exactly. So I tweeted about the fact that now I think the media has become very good, Anaita, about going into this mad feeding frenzy. And then the so-called wiser heads in media start writing about how they should not be covering the story. <laughs> that this feeding frenzy is really quite bad. And in that becomes a more ideologically elevated feeding frenzy, but it's still a frenzy all the same. However, um, I had a question to ask directly related, related to your experiences. Um, I'd like you, if, if people don't know, uh, to talk about your, you did a series of investigative uh, stories on the Dongri Raman home, uh, it's called, that was the series. And yes, we know it wasn't to, primarily to unearth some CSA, uh, story, but that sort of emerged. Just take us through that because that's a lovely uh, that's a lovely tale uh, for us to sort of understand how media can get into things and how it should be covered. Frankly, um, so this actually began with um, a colleague and I. We'd done a series of stories on kids who were forced into child labour, and these three girls were rescued and put in a remand home. And then we started hearing horror stories from the remand home. So we went in. We went in with chocolates and biscuits as social workers with a tape recorder below that. Uh, we taped what the kids had to say, you know, we published a series. Ours was focused on the poor conditions there, how horrible it was living there. Uh, we were not looking at CSA at all. Um, but after we, after our stories, the, um, the State Human Rights Commission took up the case. Uh, we went on visits with the Human Rights Commission and on one of those visits, you know, all we had to do was put our arms around the kid. There was no real, there was no investigation. I mean, you just put your arm around the kid and he'll tell you what he's been through. And um, the term, the rather crude and maybe childish term that this little boy said was, Bade ladke gand maate hain raat ko. And that's how we wrote about it. We wrote about the instance. We wrote about the boys without their names, what they'd been through. Sorry, that and means that uh, uh, the, the, el the bigger, for people who don't understand Hindi, the elder boys uh, sodomize us at night. the younger boys. Um, take, take our ask. I mean, that's yeah, the... Yeah. Um, eventually, um, the response that we got from the remand home, which was shocking, and we ended up reporting that as well. They said one of them was a street kid and he was a, he was a rescued street kid and these things must have been happening to him on the street. So maybe he kind of imagined that it was here as well. Uh, the other, for the other boy, they, the remand home told us that his mother was a prostitute. So, well, that kind of explains, <laughs> explains right. something. Um, <clears throat> and uh, very disturbing responses and I think we've tried to highlight that as well. When you did, when you, uh, when, when these stories broke, uh, what was the response from um, the CSA community of NGOs? Did you get enough support? Did you get, um, was there any kind of, um, what should I say, carry on factor? Um, no, I, the Human Rights Commission took it up though. Um, maybe at that point, not really. Okay. Uh, you've done, uh, uh, quite a few of these undercover sort of uh, investigations. How do you find out about such cases? Where, did, where do these first, uh, you know, sort of spurts of news start coming into your, into your consciousness? I think the more people 
who know that you're doing this, you know, somebody will tell you about something, some school principal will tell you that somebody who's in a remand home is facing this. Um, somebody is, you know, uncles, aunts, someone will just know that you're doing this and, you know, feed the information to you. So once you have a large enough network and enough people know that this is something you could do, you suddenly start getting these, uh, you know, things trickling in. There's something that, I'm, that when I throw it open, I want, I want people to sort of uh, contribute to this. But I want to table it right here just so that you can start thinking. Is that, you know, there's a road safety week that, say, X news newspaper will have. Y newspaper will have a youth studies of consumption or their Im Im impression of political leaders. You know, these weeks that happen where you can see that the... This, the, it's, it's a very well-conceived story around the 360 degrees of an issue and it's a survey, come vox pop, come blah, de, blah, blah. Question is, why don't we have one for CSA? Why don't we have, so yeah, I mean, I, that's what I want you, to, you guys to start answering and just chatting about. And then when we throw it open, we'd love to get some ideas as to how we can make this interesting to put out there. Not sensationalistic, but just interesting because I think there's a great uh, value behind having CSA week. Maybe one newspaper can get behind it. But, Tanya. But I wouldn't suggest that a newspaper do a CSA week by itself unless there are more stakeholders in it. The reason being that most people don't understand when they talk about CSA. I can give you a few examples. Poc uh, the POXO Act clearly says that you should not mention a school's name if there is an act of uh, sexual violence, right? There was, a, there was a rape case in Bangalore some months ago in a school, uh, upmarket school, which had become a huge problem. And I remember everyone were competing to name. And some of the senior editors, uh, because they are colleagues, I would call them up and say, don't name the school. They're like, but no, only if you name the school will people get to know about it. The other simple things like uh, which we don't follow. So I think the CSA week primarily should be for reporters and for editors. And only when they learn how to report on it. No, I'm very serious because uh, we are going to pass misinformation, uh, which, is, which is not relevant, I think, and, and wrong. So. Well, okay, so then, then it obviously segues into a far deeper question, which is before we actually expect the media to conduct something uh, like this in a responsible fashion, there has to be a certain education done. I mean, this could well be next time something that you do for media. Yes. So again, here's, here's another way to talk about, would there be enough interest from the side of media to say, we'd love to come and send our reporters right here to, to understand more about the issue. Do you think there's a constituency of people in media open to that? Yeah. Um, absolutely. In fact, um, there's an offer for you. Uh, I'm on the managing committee of the press club and I'd love it if you, you know, organized a session for us and educated more reporters. <laughs> well, I can say yes, but Suchi and John will have to do all, we'll have to do all the work. Done. Okay, so then uh, this is, this is uh, uh, in between now and our, and our third ASC CSA, this will be done for sure. And uh, I'm sure we can throw it open to all of us also. We can also come and attend and sort of throw tomatoes and eggs and things like that. <laughs> at ourselves. Why are you laughing? At ourselves. At ourselves. Um, Swati, I had another question for you. Um, this couldn't have been easy. To create the episode couldn't have been easy, partly because you were asking people to come up with stories that would affect people around them. So were there difficulties in actually getting them to speak? Well, actually, Rahul, uh, any, uh, any relationship that is based on some amount of trust generally works. And uh, our effort for all of Satyamev Jayate, not just on this episode, was uh, to make an effort never to approach anything as a story, but to always approach every individual as a human being, first and last. And my strict advice to my entire team, because I led the field research, was the camera comes last. And uh, my experience has been that the generosity of spirit and the courage with which people have come forward and generously shared with only one thing that they always say, ki shayad kisi aur ka bhala ho jai. perhaps someone else will benefit, someone else may not suffer what I have suffered. So honestly, we had very little difficulty in getting people to speak. Then of course, some may not want to come on camera, some may not wish to come on television. Those are different issues. But uh, to be willing to 
share their deepest sorrows worries experiences and to shape our understanding i think hundreds of people came forward and i think that uh, we have a dearth of listening in our country nobody wants to listen to you so if if somebody genuinely wants to listen which i think we did uh, then uh, people just open up their hearts what i also wanted uh, meant was that um, if there were people who were talking about stuff being done currently that they were experiencing and going through currently there is a whole bunch of people who don't want those uh, people to speak did you encounter cases like that we and if you did what 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 did you do we did encounter cases like that and uh, these people so we had some mental health experts and counselors with whom we were engaged and engaging and uh, we took advice on th from them on how uh, what we could say to these people because you see then this whole thing of interviewer and interviewee just breaks down there is nothing like that there is no and we are just two human beings talking to each other so you have to reach out with something reach out to say that you are not alone reach out maybe to suggest that that person could approach someone for help and then to say that whatever we have spoken is just between us and is sacrosanct and it will never come out no matter what so nothing will be done for the sake of the show ever so that was a that was a promise we made and we kept dania um you your trajectory if it if i'm not wrong started from times now to what you it's yours called newsminute.com and that's something you started yeah. right so uh, the the more general question which i will not ask is what's the difference because that's that's not relevant to this this forum but more but more um, precisely uh, when it comes to now uh, freedom and reportage and a change in how you would report a, a csa case uh, tell me how that you're looking at that has changed from uh, perhaps how you were doing it for any television channel versus now uh, what you're doing for yourself how, how have how have your views either sharpened or just changed I, it's definitely sharp and uh, i mean there are quite a few people here who i've worked with at various uh, stages so they do know that like when you work for a television channel it's really different like i can tell you times when we have actually chased accused like uh, the guy would be living in his house in vishakhapatnam or in chennai and he's not arrested we'll just be standing outside the house for 3 days 4 days there's a child sexual abuser we are talking about and the moment he comes out we'll put the mic and say did you abuse the child did you abuse the child that's it three four times and i have really done it many many times so uh, but i guess i've moved on from that uh, the problem with television is or even print i guess to a large extent uh, she of course specializes in these stories but there are people in crime reporting who are suddenly put into a child sexual abuse story and they have no clue what they're dealing with the other day there was a story from the madras high court where the, a judge in the madras high court told a victim why don't you marry the rapist and uh, i'm not kidding but a senior editor of a news channel uh, who's the editor for all the bureaus actually said it's not important i think they knew each other the rapist and the accused that's the whole point in india a huge number of victims do know the perpetrator so i think it's the basic things which people uh, in the larger media setup do not know not because they don't want to know they don't have the time to sit and research about child sexual abuse to understand it because today they're on child sexual abuse tomorrow they're on rape day after tomorrow they're on politics next day a bridge collapses so let's say that um, your sensitivity uh, was appalled or or awakened etc by your experience with mainstream news media but how then uh, did you educate yourself did you talk to people to say okay next time i do stories whether it's for news minute and uh, or dot com whoever i shall now reapproach it in 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 the following way did you have to uh, rethink uh, educate yourself as to how to actually t handle these stories so i'll be extremely frank here one of the reasons why i changed is most of you know vidya reddy right so vidya would always scream and yell when i called her and she will yell at me so badly that i will be forced to go back and research so sometimes don't be nice to journalists just because you want the news out just don't be nice to them if they don't know the information you have to make sure that you tell them i mean that's how i think many people change because when they are told that you know you are not saying the right thing just because you're a journalist this information is not correct and the other thing is that which i guess she can throw more light on i think all newspapers should not make crime reporters cover cases of child sexual abuse and either feel free to 
uh, I think crime reporters, the beat reporters, should not cover sexual abuse cases unless they are sensitized because that's what is spoiling not only child sexual abuse, even if, when it comes to crimes against women, that is what is spoiling the reportage in this country. They should have a specially special editorial to cover only these cases. One person is enough. Like if she heads that particular editorial and she tells a reporter, gives the input. Do you agree with that? Um, and I feel free, and I was unfair to you earlier when I said that I disagree with you. <laughs> if you do feel that there is a greater sensitivity, please elaborate. Um, I agree with her to the, to the extent, but I also feel crime reporters in particular need to be trained and sensitized not just in child sexual abuse, but in the law as well. You cannot be doing this. You cannot be revealing these details. Um, often, I mean, crime reporters have to depend very heavily on the police. They are your sources. You can't completely turn the tap off and, you know, you won't get any stories. How much to take from them? They'll give you an entire charge sheet and a newspaper once printed it in all its gory details. That was shameful. So I think... Um, I think there needs to be everyone from the editor to ev the, the intern in your office needs to know about how to deal with this. I mean, anybody could on a, maybe on a Saturday or a Sunday, you have your, you know, short staff, your, you send out an intern to cover a story. You need to know what the laws are. So, uh, yeah. Rahul, I'd just like to jump in here. Since we're talking about change, I think that, yes, of course, training is very important. Knowing the law is very important. I think for me, a turning point in when I was researching uh, this episode and there was another one we had on sexual violence was uh, we all need to turn the searchlight in, not really think of ourselves in silos. But we are all working at a, you know, at a point in which many things converge, law, media, society, and so on. And each and every one of us needs to turn the searchlight in to see what actually lies deep within. And I want to tell you what I found. Uh, with your permission, I'm going to read a little bit out. The old man lifts Anjali in an erotic impulse, takes her upstairs, places her on his lap, and after removing the tiny garment or underwear, goes through the exercise of inserting his genitals into the vagina of the victim. There is bleeding consequent on the violent violation and the appellant brings the little bell downstairs crying. The circumstances establish beyond doubt that there is no law of limitation on the lascivious propensities of man and that age cannot wither overpowering moods of voluptuousness. You might think that I'm reading out from some lurid novel, but actually I'm reading out from a Supreme Court judgment. Now, I have more. And this turned a searchlight inward for me. Not, it was not about the court, but it's about what all of us believe. What all of us actually have deep within us. How do we see rape and sexual assault? I mean, we would go with a tagline that says, repeat sex offenders. But pardon me, they are not sex offenders. They are sexual abusers. They are violent sexual crime offenders. And I think that unless and until we are willing as society to turn that searchlight in and to say, hey, this is a huge problem. No media alone can solve it. No NGO alone can solve it. No lawmaker alone. No police alone. We have to all get together to protect our children. And let's solve this not competitively, not by doing frenzied feeding mm. and so on. But to actually like this room is a great place. We could make a great start right here. And then the other fact, I think, and this again report uh, in our reporting and in whatever we do, that sex is not like it's not about passion. The respondent, longing for his less of his passion, laid down the girl on a sofa in his drawing room, remained lying on her and closed her mouth so the girl could not scream. A little let later, wetting his sexual appetite, he got up, opened the door, allowed the girl to go out. I'm talking about a Supreme Court judgment reporting on a 70 year old man committing rape on a five year old child. And then finally, this last one. Three boys between the ages of 10 and 14 with simmering sex urges amid social inhibi societal inhibitions and infatuating stimulations come by an 11-year-old girl tending cattle in a village. This by happenstance was near a neglected brick kiln which temptingly offered protective privacy for carnal assault. This opportunity excited the three youth lust-ridden, 
who behaved in a carefree manner trying to make the most out of the situation because the girl was alone and helpless she cried for help and struggled with the accused to save her honor now i can go on and on there's a whole book that can be written but the supreme court is not out of society and nor are we so i feel that this recognition that this is about honor that this is about sex that this is about lust we have to change the language because we as media work with words and ideas and if our words and ideas are pardon the french fucked up we need to really start from the root that's what i'd like to say yeah i think you made some 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 very very um, uh, important points swati most of all is that this room is a great start because you know how it is for some reason and i i have never i've never faced the, i've never done this in my career as an actor is that the media is on the other side i'm like you know w- w- what does that mean so i i really haven't believed it and i think that uh, people like um, dhanya and um, anahita even if they are not as sensitized and as um <sighs> boundaryless as as you uh, there are uh, the, the the whole of the media as far as i'm concerned and that that's what i want to talk about later there should be a complete flow you know it's it's too late it's too late in the day to to start having fences we have to flow through and and i believe that in every aspect of life there's just all you all that needs is um a trust and a dissolution of the ego of the self but we can we can get to that later uh, suchi will you come on stage and introduce yogesh we must accord him the same privilege that everybody else has had and uh, uh, introduce him and then yogesh i'll fill you in into what we've been chatting about and then we can take it on uh, with you um, let suchi finish introducing you yogesh unfortunately was stuck in traffic he's just been able to make it thankfully in time so uh, yogesh was working with mumbai mirror and a lot of you in the room are probably aware he exposed the kavdas case which was a huge case um and uh, he not only exposed it he's followed up with the case he it keeps track of everything that's happening made uh, all the visits to the court so actually yogesh if there's anything else you would like to add to tell people a little bit more about yourself you could please go ahead and do that Right so Yogesh I'll tell you uh, I started this discussion which I'm going to pick up uh, Suchi how much time do we have left 15 so then we should just we'll, I'll, I'll I'll get the inputs from Yogesh and then throw it open let's have a good 10 12 minutes chatting about this is that um, before we start talking about the CSA community media I first you ask the CSA community have we done enough to make this um to put out the information that we say has not been put out have we done enough for the media to to be educated as Dhania said to understand and to sensitively and correctly yet impactfully report on not just x and y and z case but on the fact that this is endemic and this is uh, uh, under a massive shroud of secrecy so that's i was just laying out those parameters and then of course everybody was talking about uh, their few points on the issue uh, so let me first ask and since uh, you've you 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 joined in late i want to ask you a specific question i'm sure you must have come with some things that you would like to say Uh, but if you have go ahead if you don't i can ask you a specific question which would you prefer ask ask great so in that case i'm going to ask you to talk about talk us through the case that you did and your learnings about um the media uh, and uh, the csa community as well as the uh, whether we call them survivors or victims or whatever it is but you know just just take us through stuff that you might not have shared uh, people in this room having read about the case might still not know I'm really sorry I got late I'm coming all the way from Pune so I'll jump straight to the point so basically this case was about uh, mentally deficient uh, children all un- between 5 and 13 and uh, I was acting on a tip off that there was a problem at this shelter uh, this was also I must admit my first ever serious uh, child abuse case so I had little or no experience on how to go about it in a shelter home when they spent a lot of time uh, i i was officially a donor so i was loaded with money and uh, chocolates and everything because i didn't want the guys to know that i was a journalist so once i went there then i figured oh, kids were locked up in a room there were 18 of them uh, malnourished severely a uh, whole lot of issues i mean eventually then then the since they were mentally deficient but there were some borderline cases the kids started talking i could see cigarette butt marks all, all over their body they were starving uh, 
the ones who were locked up in a room were uh, hadn't been given food for almost about a week uh, and uh, obviously initially the the uh, uh, shelter home uh, management didn't want me to see that side but i went with two other friends who were brilliant actors so they kept everybody busy and i uh, was able to go around the shelter eventually my problem there it, after that i went on to cover at least uh, eight or nine of such uh, shelter homes some with the authorities some on my own and uh, yeah so now almost shelter homes across maharashtra i've been to i've been to nasik i've been to karjat and uh, more or less the strategy is uh, don't don't tell the author the guys that you're a journalist so just uh, pretend to be someone and figure what's really happening and in most cases children are not going to tell you in the first uh, go that i've been abused sexually physically so you need to spend enough and more time understand where they're coming from pick up pick up their body language pick up uh, uh, you know the observe the surroundings and then figure what's really wrong and maybe check 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 and then before you start screaming and saying there is something wrong there is there are multiple levels of uh, cross checking so i think as as a media person uh, our responsibility it's it's not as simple as me simply walking into a center and saying there is a problem coming out and going uh, because one the biggest problem is that there's literally when you try and do an expose there's literally no support from any agency so i've i've had uh, i've reported in my all the cases almost all the cases that i've done whether it was a nasik shelter whether it was a karjat shelter whether it was this kavras uh, first you report to the local agencies which is the cwc or the child welfare committee the first reaction of most child welfare committees uh, is everything's fine we've done a survey there is no problem then you try and obviously reach out to the cops the cops also try and tell you the same story please uh, Uh, so in the end uh, often there are times when you just want to give up and just don't want to bother because everybody is trying to tell you that you're lying or maybe you've not done enough research but if you're at it i mean it does take time you need to gather enough evidence uh, and even after a case gets registered and investigators begin that's what i was going to ask you well the aftermath i mean after yeah. the story is broken yeah are you still in i used do you, do you still write about it or yeah, are you just yeah, yeah. you find yourself personally still involved in it or you just move on no i i i take almost every case of mine to a logical end till such time that the guilty are punished so it might take 4 years so i'm constantly at the case during court hearings i'm there through and through i've moved to pune but i keep coming back to bombay for some of those cases you are involved emotionally as a journalist in every which way uh but so the lines the so the blurring of lines is something quite 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 welcome uh, today i mean the this this whole idea of i took a photograph of this because i'm just a photographer versus helping i think we're way past that in in, in this world today to 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 hold those lines firm no you i mean it's happened to you naturally it's happened to you too you know i mean it happened it's happened obviously it's happened to everybody actually on this podium but um, should we should we talk a little bit about this uh, let me first ask the first question that i started with how can we I, i'm thinking about a csa week you know and and uh, Tanya very clearly said before you do a before you ask a media group to do a CSA week like a road safety week like a you know youth awareness week kind of thing you have to first um, get journalists to understand what the issue is what the issues are around this central fulcrum issue and how to report it and then Anahita very uh, uh, generously said that I am the vice president just <laughs> a managing committee member managing committee member of the press club and that uh, you know we can have we can use a forum like this to actually to, for all of us to sit and just in a very very friendly way talk to media and say look these are the issues and now let's ideate as to how this can be uh, how this can be made media friendly so therefore yes so you know what i'm going to ask please can we get a mic that works binish just speak into it it's very easy to to Uh just yeah. yeah let's just pass one of these mics on thanks will you pass it on to those uh, the um, the dudes yeah yeah this one works uh this is um mm, mm. Oh, feel free to ask questions by the way it doesn't yeah. have to be just an you know you just yeah. feel free to mm. well we're looking at two sides of the coin over here one is educating the media but i think also the ngo sector 
requires some education on the media because, I mean, I, I, I happen to straddle both worlds. One is the world of Rahi and I also used to be a journalist. There are deadlines to meet. There are bites over here. You know, you cannot help it if a story breaks out and, and you need to talk to someone. You know, so I think from the NGO sector, you need to understand, yes, people from the print media or the electronic media, they are not educated enough over the issue, will ask you questions using the wrong terminology. Let's have some patience out there. Explain it to them because I know over the last, what, about 10 years or something, uh, yeah, 18 years, uh, apart from two or three incidents, we worked very well with the media. I mean, your AKP team was excellent. You know, I mean, you know, when the shooting was taking place at my house, Prerna was, you know, every time she went in to give an interview, she pounced on me and said, am I doing it right? Am I doing it right? So there is a lot of sensitivity over here. People call us up. They say, look, we need the story right now. It is a deadline. What can I do? You give them that much of 15, 20 minutes space and they listen. I think it works both ways over here. The, the sharper question here is, how can we actually, because we know that it's case to case that's happening in terms of any reporting of CSA. But the idea that this is endemic, that this is all over, that this is agnostic to rich, poor, uh, rural, uh, uh, you know, urban, and it and the statistics are it's it's you know horrifying. And now is the time. We don't we don't we don't want to wait for a nirbhaya moment in CSA for everybody to start talking and and, and sort of you know and for 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 reportage to cases that report to be spiked. How can we actually put that out there and say, India, if you want to talk, it's okay, you can talk. So I have a small input. So, yeah. like what you said, I've mm. encountered two types of people. I'm, I'm sure the same. Either it's an NGO or someone, a stakeholder who's shrouded in secrecy, who will mm -hmm. not tell me anything about what is happening. Mm -hmm. And then I just have to sit and imagine and write fiction. And then there are those people who help me. So, I think sometimes um, many of you in the room uh, may think that the media is not a stakeholder, they are someone outside, why should we speak to the media? There is a lot of sensitivity about the case, uh, the, the victim does not want to talk, victim's family does not want to speak, but you have to understand that if you are not going to divulge that sensitive information, the information which is necessary, then th that reporter is going to get it from someone else. Absolutely. And that person yeah, turns absolutely. out to be the cop in most cases, who will tell the most absurd of things. So I think that at some level NGOs also should start talking to the media, especially right. when there is a case which is happening. At least give them what is needed. Like I know people who won't even tell us the age of the victim, nothing. There will be mm -hmm. no information passed on. I want to add to that. And ma'am, after that we'll come to you. I think there's also been a sort of failure on both our parts, the media and, G and the NGO sector, because I think there's this wealth of information out there in the, C the community working with CSA that I don't think we've adequately tapped into. And I also think at one level, maybe a lot of NGOs, as you were saying, to be educated in the media with deadlines, with what makes news, often a brilliant report on the topic may not have anything newsy in it or newsworthy. So how to target maybe stories, maybe data, you know, how, how, how best to target the media with something that has not been out. And also, I think it's important for all of you to jump in when you see a story being reported, a crime story as Correct. we've been talking about, by maybe someone who's not, you know, handled CSA or knows how to do it. Jump in and offer your quotes, offer to, you know, offer an angle that you feel has not been looked at. So, yeah, I think there needs to be a bit more engagement. I, I, uh, my name is Parul and I'm from uh, Bhavnagar, uh, Gujarat. Uh, and uh, name of my, our organization is Shaisho. We are running a child helpline and we encounter several such cases where uh, there are lots of uh, CSA cases where the abuses happen through very close family members, including father. Now it is, uh, we've had some case, uh, one thing is that usually uh, one of our experiences that all media attention is always in the larger cities, you know, like in big cities, but uh, the grassroots experiences are not uh, getting any attention from media. That is one concern. The second thing is that sometimes when the way it is uh, put forward in media, it is so bad that it really kind of threatens us and uh, the way the identity of the child or the uh, uh, perpetrator is 
you know the way it is and particularly in the community it gives very bad uh, impact on the child and everything so it becomes much more difficult for us while we understand that we need to give you some information sometimes the way the fact are distorted like for example people interview uh, us on the phone and when i request that okay before you write or finally send it for printing can you share us a copy of it so that we can ensure that there is no factual error no we can never do that and even after that the all with the factual errors and everything uh, the information goes so all these experiences really uh, uh, kind of create a rift between yeah, you know between because, the, the because lack of, of that, trust sure we we stay away from media we don't like to yogesh i i completely agree with you and i see that happening quite often with uh, quite a few journalists around so i know but can i sincerely request that you know please try and make them understand because the minute the, the more you shy away from them as anaita said those issues a will not get reported uh, and i'm not saying media is the only medium to to actually get justice but it does play an important role trust me and i've seen that uh, quite often where authorities are not willing to register cases i've seen cases registered there's just a case in pune where 21 uh, uh, school going girls were uh, uh, abused by one of their teachers senior teachers reported the case but the principal never wanted the case to really come out in media so journalist uh, did a very lazy job simply went to the local police station got all the inputs typically and pathetic input said that the investigation of a officer completely jumbled up the case did not give any information uh, just a couple of weeks ago the case was thrown out for want of evidence because the investigating officer did a bad job now there i believe had media jumped in and kept a track of the case through school management or through the ngo involved i think the officer would have done a much better job maybe a better officer would have been so you'll have to be slightly patient we are not perfect we need to truly understand i've also seen cases where our journalists are ignorant about the fact that uh, not disclosing the identity of the victim so i understand so this oh, xyz ka naam nahi denge lekin abhi uska uncle hi to hai to uncle ka naam de dete hain whereas the rule says uncle ka naam bhi mat do so there i completely understand give You'll the name of the area give nothing, the name of the area, everything area so it's everything. nothing it nothing we see a sensible error. journalist will basically keep out all this information while giving out some information in a manner some of it which you may not agree you might say that completely blank out i need to build a case for me to build a case i'll have to basically do something to indicate 4 year old 8 year old generic yeah. something some profiling needs to be given because how else do i connect to my audience uh, you might say that completely blank out just say 8 year old uh, from bhavnagar but 8 year old from bhavnagar doesn't make sense to my reader so i'll have to do but you you and i can work on that together but please be patient that's the only way uh, right the bell has gone uh, it's a very kind bell by the way there should be a harsh bell no wonder nobody is stopping this is just you know it's a very sort of a gentle sort of thing uh, uh, like a lullaby but we do have a lady there who'd like to say something we get, we're getting the mic to you and once you do say that something i'm going to ask all you guys if there's anything at all that we just want to say just go ahead and say uh, i am vidya apte i represent forum against child sexual exploitation and we have been working in mumbai on this issue for last 19 years uh, coming to your idea of csa week uh, sounds good but i think one has to give a lot of thought to it because she uh, talked about uh, uh, enlightening or awareness of journalist but if because of this csa week there is lot of awareness created and there are lot of uh, 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 disclosures by victims huh? there should be systems in place to address that giving help to the victims otherwise it amounts to opening the pandora's box and not providing enough help and there are very few professionals and even ngos working currently on this issue taking up cases actually Guys, I, I have a question to ask the audience. Oh, sure. uh, this is something which I have been encountering for the last one, one and a half years, and I want to know if that's your experience as well. Uh, maybe she would, she would agree. Today, when I put out a story, two questions are asked to me first: What is the religion of the perpetrator? Is that asked you too many times recently? Okay, I always encounter that. I don't know why they want to know the religion of the perpetrator. Like the guy called Mustafa was arrested in Bangalore. Ha! That is Mustafa. 
so they and the second thing is is there a perverse need amongst parents they do they ask you the name of the school tell us where it's happening tell us where it's happening like people around the area if they think there's a case happening do you think regular people want to know more details not journalists yeah yeah all the time they happen all the time no like specific school name ha Yes, I'm encountering that a lot now. Yeah. I, I, because I'm on Twitter and Facebook all the time. <laughs> um, there's uh, there's one problem that I faced while reporting on such issues. When it's a lower middle class or poor family, you can walk straight into a slum. The kid will talk about the rape. The parents will talk about the rape. When it comes to richer folks, it's it's so hard to get behind those gates. uh you know you barely get past the school i've had school principals saying you know you talk so much about these things that kids start imagining it you know they've been told so much that maybe that kid imagined it like maybe the 8 year old imagined that the cleaner in the bus did something how does one you know mm. any suggestions here any help from you any way that you all could help with access to richer folks who just clamp shut we're going to carry this conversation over lunch with our mouths full of uh, delicious food just one idea perhaps we need to do our long stories a long stories not newsy stories with uh, magazines like caravan who actually carry long form journalism and also the vernacular press which is 90% of uh, we got to get them into this room uh, anaita when when we do this thanks enjoy your lunch